Hello, pre-university long fiction students. Welcome yet again to another uh, video lecture on William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Today we're going to uh, discuss some of the issues, some of the ge generic issues related to the novel, situating it uh, within certain larger uh, modernist and uh, novelistic movements and tendencies. Uh, and we're also going to look a little bit at some of the animal symbolism, which also connects it back to um, epic form and tradition as well. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to start by uh, going back to some of the things that <clears throat> were discussed in the previous lecture. If you remember, uh, I spoke a bit about Michael's, uh, Michael Bakhtin's very famous 1934 text entitled Discourse in the Novel, uh, where he elaborates his theory of heteroglossia, this idea of multiple uh, forms of language taking place in particular within the novel, and the novel is uh, uniquely uh, situated to present this kind of fullness of verbal human experience, which uh, according to Bakhtin, other earlier literary forms didn't quite live up to it, and so the modernness of the novel form uh, was perhaps its saving grace there. Uh, and in order to sort of demonstrate that, I'd like to look at a couple textual excerpts uh, from the novel. Uh, the first one is a chapter that's narrated by Tull. Uh, now, Tull, Vernon Tull, is one of the neighbors of the Bundren family. He's a very uh, down-to-earth, uh, sort of solid, hard-working, uh, honorable, and uh, sort of stoic guy. He doesn't complain. He doesn't, you know, if there's things that are difficult to do, he just does them, um, which puts him slightly at odds with some of the, um, some of the uh, Bundren family members who are less like that. Um, and what I'd like to demonstrate here is sort of the, the v variety of traditions of linguistic usage that, um, that, again, that Bakhtin was alluding to in his work and that Faulkner makes full use of. So here we have something that's akin to realist narrative form. In other words, chronological, logical, uh, and just basically with its main uh, objective is to relay narrative information to the reader in a clear, straightforward, and comprehensible fashion. Um, and so this is Tull on page 85. It was 10 o'clock when I got back, with Peabody's team hitched onto the back of the wagon. They had already dragged the buckboard back from where Quick found it, upside down straddle of the ditch about a mile from the spring. It was pulled out of the road at the spring, and about a dozen wagons was already there. It was Quick found it. He said the river was up and still rising. He said it had already covered the highest water mark on the bridge piling he had ever seen. That bridge won't stand a whole lot of water, I said. Has someone told Ants about it? I told him, Quick said. He says he reckons them boys has heard and unloaded and are on their way back by now. He said we can, they could load up and get across. Now, as I said, that uh, narrative passage that we read there is just straightforward, uh, realistic narrative form. Uh, the next passage that I'd like to look at is uh, very close. It's actually, I believe, the, it's only two chapters previous to that. Um, this is narrated by Cash. And of course, Cash is an is a interesting character in the book for a lot of reasons. Um, He's also stoic. Yeah, probably there are a lot of parallels between him and Tull. Uh, Cash is a carpenter. He's very meticulous. He's a very hard worker. He's the one person in the Bundren family um, who seems to be capable of uh, a trade where he could possibly generate some money. And in fact, he has done that and he works uh, for other people uh, as a carpenter. He has his tools, which he is uh, extremely proud of. He brings them with him on the journey to Jefferson. And of course, when the Bundrens, uh, when the wagon uh, tips over in crossing the river, the tools fall into the river and uh, there's a great deal of time and energy spent uh, trying to retrieve them because they're uh, quite valuable. Um, and of course, Cash is also this, uh, he is a beloved figure for Addie um, and the whole opening sequence of the book has him uh, sawing the planks that he's going to use to make uh, Addie's coffin. And he's almost uh, childish or childlike anyways um, in the way he's presenting them to her, showing them um, and almost oblivious 
to the fact he's so wrapped up in the reality of creating this uh, coffin, which for him is an act of love for his mother, uh, that he doesn't even realize how absurd it is for him to be sawing and building her coffin outside of the window and showing it to her uh, with such sort of naive pride in a certain way. And so this is a chapter in the middle of the book on page 82 and 83, uh, where Cash narrates. He doesn't narrate much in the book. When he does, he's relatively plain spoken. But this is a curious one because, uh, as I said, he's been building this coffin. And now he gives us this list. I made it on the bevel. One, there's more surface for the nails to grip. Two, there's twice the gripping surface at each seam. Three, the water will have to seep into it on a slant. Water moves easiest up and down or straight across. Four, in a house, people are upright two-thirds of the time, so the seams and joints are made up and down because the stress is up and down. Five, in a bed where people lie down all the time, the joints and seams are made sideways because the stress is sideways. Six, except. Seven, a body is not square like a cross tie. Number eight, animal magnetism. Number nine, the animal magnetism of a dead body makes the stress come slanting, so the seams and joints of a coffin are made on the bevel. Number 10, you can see by an old grave that the earth sinks down on the bevel. Number 11, you know, while in a natural hole it sinks by the center, the stress being up and down. Number 12, so I made it on the bevel. Number 13, it makes a neater job. That's a very strange list. Um, this is actually one chapter before Vardaman's famous short chapter, My Mother is a Fish, um, and it almost sets the stage for that. But there's this curious quality because basically um, he's making a list that's enumerating why he made the coffin on a bevel. And a bevel means that he's cut angles, and so rather than having the joints of the two pieces of wood meet at a right angle, he's cut them at probably 45 degree angles, and so they meet uh, flush in the middle. And so there are a lot of reasons. Uh, it's much more elegant carpentry uh, than just nailing two end boards together, but it's also much more uh, time consuming, much more difficult to do uh, because you have to be very, very precise in your cuts and in your measurements. And so, um, and for Cash, he has spent a fair amount of time giving us his list. Now, of course, the list is rather strange because it enumerates very pragmatic reasons as to why um, he might have wanted to uh, cut this and put this on a bevel. But it also has other almost um, esoteric or unclear uh, reasons, right? One of the one of the entries, number six, is accept. Uh, number eight is animal magnetism. Um, you know, number nine is animal magnetism of a dead body makes the stress come slanting, so the seams and the joints of a coffin are made on the bevel. Um, now, that's no longer pragmatic. That's kind of almost, it's absurd, frankly, um, but it's alluding to something, an animal magnetism uh, and animal symbolism, which is something we're going to talk about later in today's lesson, um, are things that come up uh, very pointedly. So here we have this, again, multiform uh, layering of language. Again, lists and things like that are not necessarily our normal mode of language. We use a list when we want to enumerate traits and we want to kind of clear, you know, clarify things in our head or make sure that we don't forget something. Um, so here he's using this almost as like a, you know, a preformed argument. And then the last passage uh, that I'd like to look at is Vardaman. Uh, and this is after, um, this is after, Vardaman has sent Peabody's, uh, Peabody's horses after he's, he's associated the death of his mother with Peabody. I believe we've looked at this uh, passage in a, in a previous uh, lesson, but I'd like to look at it now for its uh, linguistic qualities. And so here uh, Vardaman is in the barn and he's uh, looking at, uh, he's, he's there and he has, as I said, uh, used a stick to scare Peabody's team of horses off because he finds Peabody to be responsible for his mother's net, death. Um, this is on page 56. Um, it is dark. I can hear the woods, silence. I know them, but not living sounds, not even him. It is as though the dark were resolving him out of his integrity into an unrelated scattering of components, snuffings and stamping, smells of cooling flesh and ammoniac hair, an illusion of a coordinated whole of splotched hide and strong bones within which detached and secret and familiar, an is different from my is, 
I see him dissolve, legs, a rolling eye, a gaudy splotching like cold flames, and float upon the dark in fading solution, all one yet neither, all either yet none. I can see hearing coil toward him, caressing, shaping his hard shape. Fetlock, hip, shoulder and head, smell and sound. I am not afraid. Cooked and et, cooked and et. Um, again, this is a rather strange passage also. Uh, we have a number of reasons why when we read that passage, we're a little bit... Um, disoriented possibly. Uh, number one, the use of language. The use of language is extremely atmospheric. It's very descriptive. Um, it's very poetic as well. Um, and of course, one of the key issues here is it's a description of an animal. Um, and there's an element within this uh, book that's talking about the nature of existence. And we've seen uh, Darl and other characters as well speaking about the verb to be his is and my am, um, and this passage has that as well. And so Vardaman is um, is approaching what appears to be Jules' horse, which is a very um, very volatile animal, not fully tamed, not fully uh, broken, uh, which is of course why Jules was able to get it. Uh, that's one of the key things in the in the story is that um, the the deal that he makes with Long Quick in uh, farming his back 40 acres is precisely kind of a, a scam in a sense because the horse is not really uh, it's not a good horse because it's wild it's untamed it's this um, and there's a constant comment made about these horses in this book and throughout other books uh, these uh, wild mustangs that uh, somebody uh, convinced a bunch of people to try to buy and most of them uh, didn't turn out very well. So Jewel has this horse and its temperament uh, mirrors his temperament. As I said later in this lecture uh, we're going to be looking at animal symbolism and that will be a place where we'll focus a fair bit of attention. But for the time being what we're looking at is language. Um, and Vardaman is, uh, is using the horse as a vehicle for his examination of existence. Now, of course this is problematic on a number of levels. Uh, First and foremost, because Vardaman is probably, you know, less than 10 years old. And so the words, the level of eloquence that we see in that passage uh, don't seem to be uh, appropriate for someone of his age. And we talked about this, uh, as I said in the last lecture, what Bakhtin was, was mentioning or what Faulkner seems to be preoccupied with in this book, which is that he is, uh, he has multi-form and um, sort of multi-utilities of language that it can serve many, many purposes. And we do have these uh, poetic forms and we have these utilitarian forms and we have other uh, kind of atmospheric forms. And so this particular passage uh, re represents one of those. And of course I could have chosen, uh, you know, 15 different ones from Darl, uh, two or three from uh, Dewey Dell, uh, certainly one or two from Ants as well, uh, among other characters. Uh, but those were just emblematic of the things that uh, Bakhtin was talking about in the book and how, uh, how language can function. Um, and this, this novel, the, the, the value of it, I think, is precisely playing with that sense of language and usage. And of course, that shows up in many, many places, probably most pointedly uh, in Hattie's monologue, where she gets at the distrust of her distrust of words and uh, this sense of a abnegation of the possibilities of language because language has the possibility of uh, deceiving people, being used to manipulate people, uh, and that's clearly true. Uh, there's a certain pointed irony there in Faulkner doing that in the midst of his novel, which is a you know, parade of words written on the page, uh, many of them eloquent and often uh, with very, very strong intent. So um, all of those things just harken back, as I said, to this idea of the modernist novel as you know, having multiple layers of meaning, much more so than perhaps uh, the simple realistic and naturalistic novels of preceding centuries. And according to Bakhtin, also going back to previous forms uh, where the literary forms of the past were certainly central to the cultures, and they're also central to the modernist tradition, but they are uh, limited 
in a way that, that he feels that the novel isn't. Uh, and so with that in mind, we're going to look backwards now uh, to epic poetry. I, again, I foregrounded this discussion uh, at the end of the last lecture. Uh, the epic was typically uh, the, the, the dominant early poetic form. Uh, epic means large, and typically epic poems were extremely big. Um, they're part of the oral heroic tradition, and so we have the sense of the storytelling tradition. Homer was an itinerant bard, the person who composed the Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, he was a traveling poet, and he would tell his stories. You can clearly see an interface with this particular book. Uh, as I said previously, the title is taken from the Odyssey, uh, from Agamemnon's uh, interaction with Odysseus in the underworld, and the idea of the storytelling tradition, that oral epic tradition, uh, is clearly alluded to here as well, where we have the individual uh, narrators telling their stories, each of them uh, curiously, if you think about it, um, we haven't really talked about this at all, but uh, the context of each narrative chapter, uh, it's kind of interesting to imagine what the situation for the narrator in question is, right? Is it sort of like an interview? Somebody asks Vardaman what he thinks um, because it just spills out onto the page for us. And so we have this uh, rolling sequence of uh, oral narrative. And as I said, this is the beginnings of storytelling that usually has a very clear objective. If we look at um, as, I guess, as I said previously, some of the, uh, the conventions of epic poetry. Epic typically uh, was associated with what's known as uh, the validation of an ascendant community. So the Greeks used epic to define their Greekness. Uh, the Babylonians used it for their culture. Uh, we, we saw this early in the semester that usually cultures particularly around the time of the Renaissance, when the nation state was beginning to come into its ascendancy um, and the vulgar languages became uh, part of the, each nation's literary tradition. So you had now, rather than a literary tradition purely in Latin, which was the language of the Middle Ages and of the church and of science, um, suddenly you had French writers writing in French, which what became French after this uh, jostling of various dialects, and you had English, and you had Spanish and Italian, and each of them uh, were constructing their own narratives. And frequently, uh, these narratives had uh, a, a large stake in defining a collective identity. We said previously, the, the vulgar languages had a lot to do with that. The translation of the Bible started uh, was a catalyst for developing the local languages and giving them a uh, literary and, and a cultural presence that they hadn't had before. Literacy starts to increase. And so uh, all these things start to grow. Um, now Faulkner is doing something like that similarly because he is taking the dialect form of the poor Southerners uh, and the identity of poor Southerners. Um, you know, most of the most of the modernist writers were urban and urbane, uh, very educated and very uh, you know cosmopolitan. And Faulkner made his choice to sort of define his culture, uh, his Mississippi rural white culture, in a particular way. Uh, of course, the uh, some of the distinct differences with epic, uh, you have the these heightened and illustrious characters. And of course, that's where uh, the distinction with the novel is very pointed. The novel typically as a form has lower characters. It's sort of the difference between tragedy and comedy. If you studied in your drama class last semester, uh, the distinctions between those form, tragedy typically has a high elevated diction and, and the behavior of the characters is very elevated in the novel. Uh, that is not the case, excuse me, in comedy and also in the novel. Uh, those things are not the case, and usually uh, we're sometimes making fun of people's behavior. Certainly in the novels we've read this semester, we unfortunately only got to read two. I say unfortunately, you may say fortunately, depending on your predilections. Uh, but we've only read two novels, but we have plenty of characters that would be 
uh, worthy of ridicule, starting with, you know, Mr. Collins, possibly Mr. Wickham, Lady Catherine, um, Catherine Carolyn Bingley, uh, and here, obviously, you know, you have characters like ants, uh, certainly ants first and foremost, but perhaps an another handful of characters in here might be worthy of ridicule as well, depending on how you see them. Um, that's one of the things we're going to be looking at is the, the tradition here and the behavior of these people. But these are not heightened, illustrious characters with a pedigree and things like that. Um, as I said, there is like a supernatural machinery, typically oracles or prophecies or things like that in, in a traditional classical epic. In this, um, in this particular story, we uh, have... Uh, you know, certainly we have the intervention of Christian culture, um, of those pagan pre-Christian cultures are distinctly different from the later cultures. Uh, and then this one, God uh, plays a hand, but certainly Faulkner's not a, you know, not a very pious religious person. And the characters, by and large, are not terribly pious, with the notable exceptions of Cora and Whitfield, who are more likely held up to uh, scrutiny than as, you know, being seen as a model for behavior. Epic, uh, epic tales are frequently told in what uh, Horace referred to as in medias res, beginning in the middle. Uh, these stories start at a point that's already well into the story, and then we narrate it retrospectively. Uh, we've seen that in, as I said, if we look at the older epics, the Aeneid, the Odyssey, the Iliad, all of them have that quality. Um, in this one, certainly the story is well advanced. I mean, the, the you know, as I lay dying, if it's the story of Adam's death, uh, certainly, her death is very close to happening for us, so there is, there's definitely a sense of that, um, that the story has begun before we got there. Um, we have a, a broad scope uh, and, and typically broad incorporation of language, uh, typically formulaic in traditional epic. Here, as I said, uh, Bakhtin uh, and Faulkner certainly take a, a different tack with that, and they view the variety of language as uh, typically the, the novel's purview and its strength. Um, epics often have the, uh, the situation of uh, what's known as katabasis, the descent to the underworld. Uh, both Odysseus and Aeneas descend into Hades, into the underworld, in order to uh, encounter dead people, and they become uh, aware of things that they were unaware of before. They uh, are exposed to people that they loved who have died, and they are able to tell them uh, things that enlighten them in certain ways. And obviously the, that's a, um, a convention in epic that um, the hero has, is entitled or privileged, let's say, to have these uh, unusual experiences because in the real world we generally don't get to speak with the dead. Um, and so that's obviously also uh, a literary convention for epic. Clearly, uh, katabasis, the formal descent into the underworld, uh, is, doesn't happen in uh, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, but we have a, certainly a strong parallel with Addie's appearance in the middle of the book and her narration of her chapter. And clearly, uh, you know, the way it's narrated, it almost it feels very much as if it's narrated from, from beyond, from the dead. And in fact, one of her um, one of her important themes is precisely uh, speaking about her father's attitude and her attitude, and how um, you know he didn't know she learned early on that life uh, was about getting yourself in a position where you could stay dead for a long time. Uh, a rather nihilistic perspective. Uh, for those of you who, a couple of you who've written your term essays on um, Addie's monologue, certainly the the tone and the nihilism come through. Uh, very pointedly in her words there. Um, that's, a, that's, again, another dense passage, another passage that has um, a whole lot of richness to it as well for our purposes. And um, another convention, one that we've spoken of multiple times, but just to kind of wrap it into this, uh, this genre, is that the nostos narrative, the narrative of return, is also a common theme in epic, and clearly the Odyssey is the classic case of that, where Odysseus is returning to uh, Penelope and Telemachus, his wife and son in Ithaca. And here, um, this is an ironic inversion of this. And Addie uh, is, has asked Ants, uh, 
to bring her after she dies to be buried with her family in Jefferson. And so we have a return, but a kind of an ironic return because she's returning to someplace different um, than with her family. And also uh, it becomes doubly ironic because we realized when we were reading Addie's monologue that Addie uh, viewed this request to Ants, the promise that she extracted from him as a form of punishment that he wouldn't know about. Um, and so she had asked him to uh, bring her back to her family in Jefferson in order to make him pay uh, for a variety of things, mostly uh, because she really didn't love him and she felt uh, put upon by him. And so in fact, in her monologue, she's referring to him as already dead. And so uh, this is, you know, he's already dead, but he doesn't know it. So all of these, um, are elements of the epic form that the novel has. Um, and of course, one of the things about modernism is that it is often um, inverts or subverts tradition. We talked about last class of uh, T.S. Eliot's injunction to make it new. Um, curiously, among the most famous um, modernist novels, they use as their form epic the oldest poetic form, as I mentioned last class, Joyce's Ulysses, uh, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. They take epic as their starting point. Uh, Faulkner's Sound and the Fury takes Shakespearean tragedy as its sound starting point. The title there comes from the soliloquy in Macbeth. Um, out, out, brief candle, life is but a poor player that struts his frets his hours upon the stage and is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. A soliloquy about nihilism um, after Lady Macbeth has committed suicide, and Faulkner uses that as the starting point for his novel. So we have these um, curious uh, decisions, poetic and artistic decisions, taken by the writers to employ the oldest forms, uh, forms from classical antiquity, uh, and make them in some way uh, change them fundamentally take some of the power, some of the rhetorical and the literary power of those forms and use them uh, to express something else. And so that's one of the things that we have in um, As I Lay Dying. And the last element of this, which is something that I'd like to uh, explore um, perhaps uh, in an extended fashion uh, over the next little while, is the reality within the epic tradition of the boundaries between uh, the human and the non-human. And the Greeks have always had uh, a rich poetic tradition that employed uh, animal metaphors and animal symbolism to great, uh, to great force. And very often when you read Greek myths, uh, there are often connections. Uh, you have the story of Zeus coming down as a uh, as a swan and raping Leda, who becomes the mother of Helen of Troy, and she's the force who is responsible in a certain way for the Trojan War. And you have all sorts of uh, you know other stories like that in in the great uh, epics in the Odyssey. You have the Cyclops, the famous scene with uh, Odysseus where. Polyphemus, the one-eyed Cyclops, has captured Odysseus and his men, and uh, Odysseus and his men need to sneak out of the of the cave. Uh, with, and what they do first is they blind the Cyclops. They take a hot stick, uh, a hot log that's out of the fire, and they all together they run it into his eye and they blind him, and then. Um, as they're leaving, they, they, the Cyclops has blocked the door, but he cannot see them anymore. And so he has a bunch of sheep in the, in the cave. And so Odysseus and his men have to uh, hold on to the bottoms of the sheep. They stay on the underside and Polyphemus uh, pats his hand across the sheep as they're going out and he talks to them. And he has this very, uh, very fond, discussion with sweet brother Ram, and he talks about his uh, misery over, uh, over ha having been blinded by Odysseus, which he's very, very angry about still. And he has this 
identification with the ram, sweet brother ram, that you are, you are mourning with me. Um, one of the famous cases in the Odyssey, uh, perhaps the most famous case in the Odyssey with regards to animal, uh, the animal nature and its distinction with humans would be uh, the case of uh, Circe, uh, and Circe is a sorceress, and she ends up turning uh, many of Odysseus's men because they don't do the things they're supposed to do. They end up uh, playing with Helios's cattle, and they do things that they're not supposed to do, almost like a Garden of Eden type story, um, and they end up being turned into pigs. So um, that's kind of a punishment, and of course. Uh, we see it in Dante as well, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, La Commedia Divina, where uh, Dante descends into hell as well, another case of Catabasis, um, and he views all of his, uh, many of his enemies, people that he doesn't like from Florence, and they are all in hell, and they're all, they've been turned into uh, various animals. And so the identity of people is often associated with uh, the type of animal that they have been converted into. And so, for example, one of the circles of hell um, holds the thieves, and the thieves have been transformed into snakes, uh, which is a sort of a, a snake has obviously a loaded significance in a lot of ways. Uh, clearly, there's a biblical significance, um, and actually we'll look at that a little bit when we, uh, when we look at the issues within As I Lay Dying. And so uh, animal uh, symbolism and animal presentations within these books often takes on a, a poignant, as I said, symbolic importance. And of course, uh, one of the, the most poignant uh, examples of uh, human-animal uh, symbolic interchange and interaction uh, is probably the myth cycle of the Minotaur from the Cretan um, myths associated with King Minos. Uh, king Minos was a king of Crete, and he had a fond uh, appreciation of a white bull that he had, and there was a request from the god Poseidon to sacrifice that white bull, and King Minos felt that he did not want to sacrifice his favorite white bull to Poseidon, so he sacrificed his second favorite white bull. Um, and so because of that, Poseidon became aware, and he determined that he would seek his vengeance on Minos for this uh, act of disrespect. And so he uh, cast a spell on Persephone, who was Minos's wife, and made her become very, very fond, excessively fond of the white bull that Minos did not sacrifice. Persephone contracted with uh, Daedalus, the famous craftsman, and had him build her a cow body that she could hide in, and she had uh, sexual relations with the bull and ended up becoming pregnant and giving birth to this monster uh, that became known as the Minotaur, uh, Minotaur Minos and Tauros for the bull. And so it's half man, half bull creature uh, that is a monster. And a monster is often in a mythical form, uh, something that is demonstrating montre, uh, the, the true nature, the true debased nature. So the Minotaur has to be uh, contained. They get Daedalus to build the famous labyrinth of Crete, uh, and the Minotaur is put in the middle. But eventually, uh, each year, they have to sacrifice seven of the brightest and best young uh, men and women. And so eventually, it becomes a huge drain on the society. And so Theseus is brought in to uh, slay the Minotaur, and that myth saga goes on and on and on. Those of you who studied Midsummer Night's Dream with me last semester, you may remember uh, we touched on that saga. But anyways, um, that's just to say that the, the, the relationship uh, with humans and animals in Greek mythology was very, very pointed. Now, obviously, um, As I Lay Dying is not a classical Greek story. It's a modern one. But Faulkner is using um, uh, his setting, the rural Mississippi uh, world that his novels take place in, are very closely associated with domestic animals, with farm animals. Um, and so animals take a very important place in this particular uh, story. Probably um, we see it right off the bat. Because uh, as Addie is dying, um, the mules 
that the Bundren family uh, has, their team of mules, are being used by um, Jewel and Darl to make a delivery of lumber for Tull. And so those mules are in use, and there's a, an extended dialogue with Tull and Ants about whether uh, the mules should be, uh, whether you know they can wait, uh, because Ants wants to wait and use the Bundren's mules to go. And Tull thinks that they should get started. Um, the mules become a, a very strong symbol eventually, um, because one of the things that happens is when the when the Bundrens are crossing the river with Addie's coffin, um, they end up uh, capsizing the the wagon, and the mules uh, fall into the water and die. And actually, the mules are very kind of curious. We see them associated. We see their association with pulling the wagon to get the, the coffin to uh, Jefferson. We also see a strong association with Tull. And the mules have these very heavy feet. And basically, they are uh, earthbound animals. They're animals that are associated with labor uh, and this kind of plodding. They're not fast. They're not thoughtful. But they're this plodding uh, force. And as long as they have this sort of flat ground to work on, uh, they can be effective. But as soon as you put them into uh, another set of circumstances, in particular, uh, trying to navigate the, the bridge and the river, uh, they capsize and they die. And so that's a, that's a strong association there. Uh, there's a quite a pointed contrast, obviously, with the mules and the horses. Um, we see that when, when the Bundrens are leaving, when they are getting ready to embark on their journey to Jefferson, and Ants Bundren is... Um, is making uh, complaining to Jewel that he does not want him to take the horse. And the horse is this fancy, um, he calls him a circus animal, a prancing circus animal. It's a showy, uh, flamboyant animal. Uh, and we'll talk about the horses a little bit later because obviously there's a very strong association with Jewel there. Uh, but just that there's a register of difference between the mules as these workaday pragmatic animals and the horses as perhaps this other, uh, you know, glamorous and uh, luxurious animal. Um, there are a couple other uh, strong associations with animals. Obviously, ants. Uh, ants is a character that is frequently uh, derided. He's somebody we know a, a lot about him. We know that he doesn't sweat that he can't sweat. If he sweats, he'll die. Um, and so he basically, because he can't sweat, he can't work, uh, which is, of course, relatively um, strong criticism of somebody in a farming community. Uh, if you can't do any physical work, then you probably are going to be a burden on those around you. And quite clearly, uh, Ants is, uh, most notably on his family members. He's also, ironically, frequently um, stealing from them and imposing upon them. So when the, when the mules die, he takes Jules' horse and he takes money from um, the various family members who have been saving it for various reasons so that he can uh, buy the team that he needs to replace the mules that they lost. Um, there are a couple poignant passages where Ants is described in curious ways. Um, again, this rich... Uh, vocabulary of farm language. At one point, um, Peabody is speaking about ants. And Peabody, if you remember, when he comes to uh, attend to Addie, ants has waited for a very long time before he calls him because he doesn't want to spend the money. And Peabody has a fair bit of disdain for ants because typically what happens is he doesn't want to pay the money and he ends up often avoiding paying the money. We see that when they um, encase Cash's leg in cement as well. Um, he's trying to save money from not having to go to a doctor. And so here, this is on page 44. Um, he says, he and Ants are on the porch when I come out. The boy sitting on the steps, Ants standing by a post, not even leaning against it, his arms dangling, the hair pushed and matted up on his head like a dipped rooster. He turns his head, blinking at me. Okay, so here he's seen as a dipped rooster, as if he did Typically, they dip farm animals in order to uh, treat them to get rid of parasites or other uh, things. So he looks like a rooster who's just had his head dipped. Um, but there's a more poignant one when Dewey Dell talks about him. And this might be more, um, more in keeping with Ants' character within the story. Um, 
this is when they are, um, she has cooked the fish that Vardaman had caught and they are now eating it. And so um, Pa helps himself. This is page uh, 60 and 61, by the way. Pa helps himself and pushes the dish on, but he does not begin to eat. His hands are half closed on either side of his plate, his head bowed a little, his awry hair standing on the, in the lamplight. He looks like right after the maul hits the steer and it's and it no longer alive and don't yet know that it's dead. Again, um, a rather forceful um, animal comparison here uh, because number one, not only is he being uh, compared to a cow, a steer, a bull, um, but also that he's being compared to one that uh, has just been hit on the head when you slaughter uh, the cows. They use a maul, which is like a hammer, uh, and they hit the cow in the middle of the head, and it stuns them and typically kills them. Um, and so what she's saying is that Ants looks as if he were uh, a steer that has just been hit in the middle of the head before he knows that he's dead. Um, and so those two references, and there are a couple other ones, when um, Addy is dying, uh, he puts his hand on the blanket, and it's referred to as a claw. Uh, Ants has a claw rather than a hand, and it's almost this awkward animal-like thing. Um, very often in, in classical literature, the association with animals is often has a moral one. So certain animals have a higher bearing, and certain other ones have a lesser one. Um, Uh, there's also a passage in the novel where Dewey Dell uh, is associated with a cow, uh, but in a very different way. Um, Ants is presented to us as a steer who has just been hit in the head with a maul. So he's kind of stunned and staggering and is, you know, very, barely coherent. Um, Dewey Dell, however, has a, a strong association because uh, obviously Dewey Dell is a woman. She's a young woman and she's pregnant. And one of the important themes within the book has to do with uh, maternity and fecundity, fertility. And so Dewey Dell, after Addy dies, is, uh, is required to go outside and uh, milk the cow. And so she does. And there's a very, again, an important scene here. Um, should be noted, a couple things should be noted here. Uh, Faulkner is toying a little bit with uh, issues of femininity. Um, and, you know, this book is close to 100 years old. You could argue that there might be some um, misogyny or sexism in it, but it's probably not that. It's probably a cultural relic of the way uh, women were treated at the time. Um, Dewey Dell's name is relatively symbolic. It's obviously uh, related to her fertility. fertility. Um, Dewey means moist and wet, and Dell is a valley, right? A dell is kind of a, a, a dip in the land. So Dewey Dell, uh, if you want to interpret the name, means moist valley, which it doesn't take a great deal of imagination uh, to think about where that might head uh, in a symbolic fashion. And Dewey Dell, in this particular passage, uh, is going out right after she uh, spoke <clears throat> about, um, about her father and uh, comparing him to a, a steer, now she is uh, going out to milk the cow and it becomes uh, a, a moment of strong identification between uh, the woman and the cow. The cow is very unhappy because it hasn't been milked in a while and basically a cow, uh, a cow that produces milk will produce milk and it will continue to produce milk and if it's expecting to have that milk uh, taken away, uh, it will start to be very painful. The udders of the cow will start to swell. Um, and so there's a sort of a, an identification here. Dewey Dell, the pregnant young woman and the cow, that is also a symbol of maternity and uh, fertility, are commiserating here. And there's a rather strange scene. Um, when, I, when I'm out of sight of the house, I go fast. The cow lows at the foot of the bluff. She nuzzles at me, snuffing blowing her breath in a sweet hot blast through my dress against my hot nakedness moaning. I got to wait a little while, then I'll tend to you. She follows me into the barn where I set the bucket down. She breathes into the bucket moaning. I told you 
You just got to wait now. I got more to do than I can tend to. The barn is dark. When I pass, he kicks the, the wall a single blow. I go on. The broken plank is like a pale plank standing on end. Then I can see the slope, feel the air moving on my face again. Slow, pale, with lesser dark, with empty seeing. The pine clumps blotched up the tilted slope, secret and waiting. Cow in silhouette against the door nuzzles at the silhouette of the bucket, moaning. Then I pass the stall. I have almost passed it. I listen to it, saying for a long time before it can say the word, and the listening part is afraid that there may not be time to say it. I feel my body, my bones and flesh beginning to part and open up alone. The process of coming unalone is terrible. Leif, 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 leif. I lean a little forward, one foot advance with dead walking. I feel the darkness rushing past my breast, past the cow. I begin to rush upon the darkness, but the cow stops me and the darkness rushes on upon the sweet blast of her moaning breath filled with wood and with silence. Vardaman, you, Vardaman, he comes out of the stall. You darn little sneak, you darn little sneak. That's a very curious passage um, <clears throat> because I'm not sure if you interpret it clearly, um, but Dewey Dell goes out into the barn and she is touching herself, masturbating basically. Um, and she is um, having a moment, memora memorable moment. Um, she's reliving things. And there's this connection between her and the cow. Um, she is a woman who has a baby growing in her body and this whole image of uh, fecundity and maternity. And the cow is another uh, female creature, an animal that has a strong association also with maternity. Uh, the cow has, is carrying the milk. Uh, it is the mother of a calf and it um, is nursing, it's lactating. And so um, there's that plight. You see this a bunch of times in the book um, where the, uh, the physical realities of women are brought out to the forefront. One, Dewey Dell uh, does it many times when her chapters come up in the book uh, she's very frequently connected, very pointedly, strongly to her uh, maternity, to her fem femininity. Um, and I'd like to point out a little passage in um, in Addie's chapter, kind of a similar connection to maternity. Um, because if you remember when we read about Addie's chapter, uh, she is uh, kind of at the beginning of the of her uh, monologue. She is unhappy about her situation with uh, the children. And she goes down to the spring very frequently. The spring is very much a, a, a Freudian symbol, uh, symbol of fertility and fecundity, the hole in the ground where liquid comes out of. And so um, she goes there frequently. Uh, and There's connections to the blood, the blood of the land, the strange blood of the land. This is on page 170. The other thing is um, that they, it talks about spring, the season, which is the season when the animals um, come back and when nature comes back to life. And it's typically a season of fertility. So this is page 170. In the early spring, it was worst. Sometimes I thought I could not bear it lying in bed at night with the wild geese going north and their honking coming faint and high and high wild out of the wild darkness and during the day it would seem as though I couldn't wait for the last one to go so I could go down to the spring and so when I looked at that day and saw Ant standing there in his Sunday clothes turning his hat round in his head in his hands I said ain't you if you got any woman folks why in the world don't they make you get your hair cut um, so this is a, the introduction to ants or Addie and of course the passage has been started with the geese the geese honking, and the geese are coming. Um, the geese typically uh, fly south for the winter. Probably we're talking about Canadian geese, um, geese that leave here. Um, you might go to some of the islands uh, in the St. Lawrence, and you can see these uh, bird sanctuaries where you have tons and tons of birds that come back in the springtime. And so uh, this passage is reiterating that seasonal rhythm and that sense of the spring, and it's often it's also talking about a young woman's uh, biological clock 
and her uh, physical needs. And so once again, uh, the sexuality of the women is placed at the forefront. And of course, the women, uh, their number one role is to become wives and mothers. You know, we saw that when we studied Pride and Prejudice, we saw that very pointedly that the women uh, had very few options. And certainly in this book, uh, we also see that the women have very few options, that they're limited in where they can go. Um, the last book we were supposed to read for the semester, um, Handmaid's Tale, one of the last books, um, also has a very uh, distressing uh, limiting of women's options as well uh, in a very different way, in a very dystopian way. Unfortunately, we don't get to read that one this semester, but you can go read it on your own one day. It's worth reading. Um, and so uh, this book uh, kind of puts all of the women, if we think of every female character, you have uh, Cora, you have Addie, you have Dewey Dell, you have Rachel. Um, and so you have uh, these all these women, typically their wives. Um, Dewey Dell's not. She's unmarried, which is part of her problem. But the other women are wives. And they're very much associated in these animal symbols that uh, connect to them. They're very much associated with their fertility. And the cow uh, is a symbol of fertility through the milk. And the geese are a symbol of fertility through their connection to the seasonal cycle. So there's a very strong uh, current running through the book on that level. Another of the obviously important uh, animal symbols presented to us in the book is that of the fish. Um, we have the famous chapter uh, narrated by Vardaman, the shortest chapter in the book, page 84, my mother is a fish. Um, and we've spoken of this previously. A lot of people find this, you know, sort of whatever, bizarre and humorous, I guess. Um, but the issue is that Vardaman has uh, just caught this very large fish and then the fish was alive and now it's dead um, and they're cutting it up and they're going to cook it and they're going to eat it and suddenly his mother is alive and then she's dead and so he's making all these very odd uh, associations between his mother and the fish um, and so he associates that pointedly um, he talks about his mother being a fish on numerous occasions uh, of course she starts to behave like a fish when they uh, lose her coffin in the river when they're crossing and the, the uh, wagon tips over and the coffin slides into the water and seems to swim away and Vardaman is very um, you know very emphatic on the shoreline noticing that she is uh, a fish obviously there's a certain amount of symbolism with the fish probably the most important symbolism for the purposes of the book certainly um, would be uh, that the fish is an early Christian symbol um, ichthys is uh, an acronym and you've probably seen this drawing of a fish, a very simple drawing of a fish that some people have it on a bumper sticker on their car or on their back of their car. It's just a, it's like a, it's a circular. I don't have anything to draw on here. I could have drawn it for you. Um, but the, <clears throat> the Greek acronym ichthyos, which is the word for fish, can also be the first letter of each one, uh, can be reduced to uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God. And so that's why the fish becomes a Christian symbol. Um, as a Christian symbol, it becomes a symbol of regeneration. And so certainly there is an element where uh, Addie's association with the fish could have certain relevance for the purposes of the book. And the last uh, poignant symbol, <clears throat> one that has been sort of lurking in the book throughout the whole uh, time is uh, the horse. And the horse is, as I mentioned, Previously, when we were talking about the mules, the horse is an animal with a certain amount of elegance and a certain amount of uh, luxury for the time and place that we're looking at. Um, these people, um, these poor white farmers, uh, most of them don't have horses. Horses are for more, uh, more affluent people. And so when Jewel um, gets his horse, that's kind of a, he's taking a step almost out of his normal realm and going somewhere else. Now, as I mentioned, this particular horse is wild and part of the reason why he can get it is because it's not such a desirable horse because it is uh, vaguely uncontrollable. And so um, that, um, that could be certainly problematic here. Um, now, I wanna go to a passage early on where uh, Jewel is with his horse 
and uh, he's got him in the barn. And we've seen Jules relationship with the horse is somewhat violent. And in fact, in this scene, at the end of this scene, um, he's almost fighting with the horse. It seems like it's a battle of will, um, precisely because the horse is somewhat uncontrolling. Um, this is page 12. When Jewel can almost touch him, the horse stands on his hind legs and slashes down at Jewel. Then Jewel is enclosed by a glittering maze of hoofs as, as an illusion of wings. Among them, beneath the upreared chest, he moves with the flashing limberness of a snake. For an instant, before the jerk comes into his arms, he sees his whole body earth-free, horizontal, whipping, snake limber, until he finds the horse's nostrils and touches earth again. Then they are rigid, motionless, terrific, the horse back thrust on stiffened, quivering legs with lowered head, jeweled with dug heels, shutting off the horse's wind with one hand and with the other, patting the horse's neck in short strokes, myriad, myriad and caressing, cursing the horse with obscene ferocity. They stand in rigid, terrific hiatus, the horse trembling and groaning. Then Jewel is on the horse's back. He flows upward in a swooping swirl like the lash of a whip, his body in midair, shaped to the horse. For another moment, the horse stands straddled with lowered head before it bursts into motion. They descend the hill in a series of spine-jolting jumps, jewel high, leech-like on the withers, to the fence where the horse bunches to a scuttling halt again. Very well eloquent passage. Um, one of the key things in this passage, though, is how the horse is qualified. Um, number one, when we talked about the mules, the mules are these animals that have feet of clay. They're very much earthbound. Uh, this horse is almost, the image you get is almost the mythical horse, Pegasus, uh, getting ready to fly, right? Um, Jewel is enclosed in a glittering maze of hoofs as by an illusion of wings. Okay, the horse has wings. The, the hoofs are moving so rapidly uh, that they give the illusion of wings, but certainly he's conjuring uh, this horse that is not earthbound that could almost take off. And the other strong association, obviously, um, is the snake. The, he moves with the flashing limberness of a snake, uh, and later on um, he is whipping snake limber. So that association becomes also, um, in the Christian context, the snake is the most poignant symbolic animal because it's obviously associated with the serpent in the Garden of Eden and with original sin. And that original sin has always been um, indirectly, if not directly, connected to human sexuality. The Bible and the book of Genesis has a whole lot to say about that. Um, and now that brings us to our final closing comment uh, for this particular lecture, because the horse that is so strongly associated with Jewel and so strongly associated with um, his personality is also poignantly, very closely associated with Whitfield. And um, the Reverend Whitfield, we know, rides up on a horse. And actually, in that first chapter, when we see him, um, when he arrives just after Addie's death, we get an awareness of him coming up on his horse. But um, what I'd like to look at is Darl narrating the chapter uh, right after Whitfield narrated his chapter and just the reiteration that's made to kind of double down on uh, the symbolism here. This is on page 180. As I said, we've just passed the three uh, chapters narrated by Cora, Patty, and Whitfield in succession. And now we have Darl um, slipping us kind of back into the stream and the flow of the narrative. But Darl's passage begins, on the horse he rode up to Armstead's and came back on the horse, leading Armstead's team. We hitched up and laid cash on top of Addy. When we laid him down, he vomited again, but he got his head on the, all over the wagon back in time. Okay, now here he's talking about Jewel, but of course, previously um, in the passage where, uh, where Whitfield is crossing the river and moving to get to um, get to Addie in before she dies. Uh, it's reiterated numerous times that he is also on his horse. And so uh, the very pointed uh, juxtaposition of Jewel coming back on his horse and 
uh, Whitfield crossing his the river on the horse presents them as a pair. And of course, the symbolism of Jules connection to his horse is also partially symbolic of his connection to Whitfield. And of course, that connection to the snake and the duplicity in the Garden of Eden is also uh, directly and perhaps indirectly as well um, associated with Whitfield and Addie's duplicity in their extramarital affair and in uh, Jules' secret parentage. So that is all for our lesson for today. Um, next week, you will be working on a series of question sets, and you will basically be preparing uh, answers for those questions that will eventually be an essay that you will write the following week. So uh, we will probably have um, Zoom question sessions coming up for you to ask if there's anything you need explained. Uh, and if not, you can work on the question sets at your own rhythm. And then the final assignment, I'll give a date for that very soon, uh, probably that la one of those last weeks uh, into May when we, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll fix that date relatively soon. So have a nice day, and I will see you.